Good morning. My name is Rod McInnes of the Lady Davis Institute of McGill University in Montreal. Um, it's indeed a great honor to be asked by David Valley to introduce him as the recipient of the Society's Victor A. McCusick Leadership Award for 2014. This award, named in honor of the late Victor McCusick, recognizes individuals whose professional achievements have fostered and enriched the development of human genetics, as well as its assimilation into the broader context of sci society, science, <coughs> medicine, and health. David is presently the Henry Knott Professor and Director of the McCusick Nathans Institute of Genetic Medicine at Hopkins. As a leader in human genetics research, he has identified the molecular basis of many monogenic disorders and made major contributions to the treatment of many inborn errors of metabolism. He has also <coughs> identified many genes that have to contribute to the risk of schizophrenia. David has led, in addition, major efforts to improve medical genetics education by developing medical genetics curricula at Hopkins, uh, by being on the editorial team and then the editor-in-chief of the reference textbook of our, of our um, discipline, The Metabolic and Molecular Basis of Inherited Disease. I think you will all agree a magnificent uh, tome. And lastly, by directing the Johns Hopkins Human Genetics Pre-Doctoral Training Program for more than 25 years. And in fact, David has been directly involved in training more than 500 students, fellows, and residents, I think many of whom are probably sitting here today. In keeping with his being the recipient of the McCusick Award, uh, David has co-directed the annual short course in me medical and experimental mammalian genetics, a venerable course started by Victor McCusick, more than 50 years ago, and organized by Hopkins and the Jackson Laboratory. Amongst his many honors and numerous other leadership roles, David served two terms as a member of the Board of Directors of the Society and was the president of the ASHD in 2003. Please join me in welcoming David Valley as this year's recipient of the Victor McCusick Award. Thanks, Rod. It's a genuine pleasure to be introduced by a longtime friend and respected colleague. Let me start by saying that I'm honored, humbled, and amazed to be the 10th recipient of the McCusick Leadership Award. Honored because the recognition comes from the society that has been my intellectual and spiritual home for more than 40 years. Uh, as in the case for most of you, our annual meeting is a real homecoming for me, uh, a time to see old friends and recharge the intellectual batteries. Humbled because the previous nine recipients, Ramoyne, Nance, McCusick, Matulski, Epstein, Rosenberg, Collins, and the Hirschhorns uh, are all my heroes. How could it be that I'm in their company? And of course, especially humbled because Victor McCusick was a valuable friend <clears throat> and colleague for the nearly 40 years that our careers overlapped at Hopkins. And finally, amazed because I think of this award as something given to the more senior members of our society. And then I realized I am a more senior. <laughs> I know precisely when I met Victor on July 3rd, 1969, exactly three days uh, into my year as an intern on the Harriet Lane Home Service at the Johns, in the Department of Pediatrics at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. I was instructed by my senior resident to call Victor's office to place a consult on a dysmorphic infant I had inherited on the 1st of July. I had some trepidation placing the call because I was well aware of Victor's reputation as a preeminent medical geneticist. And my anxiety increased when Victor himself answered the phone. He told me uh, that he would be there in 15 minutes. And he was, walking down the hallway, leading an entourage of about 20 others, 
including Margaret Abbott, Tony Murphy, and many others. Looking for an answer for my patient, I quickly presented the case and we examined the baby together. After a minute or two, Victor looked at me and said, I don't know, and departed as quickly as he had come. I learned then the difference between being responsible and being a consultant. Initially, I was disappointed to be left without a diagnosis, but later uh, I realized that Victor was being completely honest and recognized that any suggestion he might make, no matter how tenuous, would immediately lock the child into the suspected diagnosis. This intellectual honesty was the first of many lessons I learned from him. Over the next several years, I saw more and more Victor at Hopkins, and especially at the annual short course held every summer at the Jackson Labs in Bar Harbor, Maine. We became good friends <clears throat> and worked on common problems. I greatly valued his uh, tremendous uh, friendship, his many contributions to genetics and medicine, his judgment, and his dedication to education, and to this field, genetics, which dominated both of our lives for the more than 40 years our careers overlapped. One of the great pleasures of this award was the chance to share the news with Ann McCusick. So uh, how did I get into genetic, genetics? My career has been greatly influenced by a, li a lifelong fascination with biology and the great good fortune to be exposed to many valuable mentors. I grew up in rural upstate New York where I spent all my free time roaming the woods and fields surrounding our house, often with my dog as my sole companion. I always had tubs of frogs, snakes, turtles, you name it, in the garage and in my room. I went to a central school in Baldwinsville, New York, and one of my earliest memories was being excited when I, under, when I learned in fourth grade that you actually got to take a course in biology in seventh grade. <clears throat> my first mentor was my seventh grade biology teacher, Phyllis Mangano. She gave me many opportunities to explore biology beyond the boundaries of the classroom, including sending a loner microscope home with me for the year and showing me how to do uh, experiments with planaria, the amazing flatworm that can be induced to grow two heads. Later in my junior year of high school, I took an advanced biology course and <clears throat> my teacher and second mentor, Jerry Willem, convinced me to go to Duke because they had a strong biology department. My freshman year at Duke, 1961, was momentous for me on three accounts. First, I met Calvin Ward, a fly geneticist, and started four years of work in his laboratory. This was my entry into genetics. Second, walking home from the lab late one night, I decided on a career in medicine because it gave me the opportunity to stay in touch with biology while at the same time directly helping others. And third, I had a blind date with Susan Twigg, who has become my wife and companion and lover for the ensuing 53 years. All in all, a pretty good year. I stayed out at Duke for medical school and worked my entire four years with Jim Sidbury a pediatrician and biochemical geneticist. Jim was great, unassuming, smart, funny, treasured by patients and colleagues alike. Jim had a tremor, uh, and this was a real hazard in the lab. Uh, he was forever spilling acid on his clothes. For this reason, his wife Alice made him wear acid-resistant pants. <laughs> designed for gas station attendants. He only wore ties when he was called to the dean's office, and he always dressed in a uh, unique thin white shirt with splayed collars. I've never seen anyone else wear these shirts. One day, we went to see a young patient whose family had just arrived from out of state 
to see the great Dr. Sidbury. When we walked into the patient's room for the first time, the father took one look at us and asked in a deep southern drawl, are you boys here to fix the air conditioner? <laughs> of course, when they experienced uh, Jim in action, they realized that they had entrusted their child to the best. When I finished at Duke, Jim sent me to Hopkins for pediatrics and genetics. During my residency years, I learned how to be a doctor and loved every minute of it. At the completion of my residency, John Littlefield hired me directly as an assistant professor charged with running the pediatric genetics clinic, something I did for the first 12 years, my first 12 years on the faculty. It was during those years that I got to know many great Hopkins docs, Mike Kaback, Bill Zinkum, Saul Brusselow, and most importantly, Barton Childs. His influence on me was and continues to be profound. Barton both challenged and nurtured me and opened my eyes to the consequences of genetics and genetic thinking for all of medicine. What amazing good fortune to be able to work with him for more than 25 years. Supported by HHMI, I also had the chance to do an on-site sabbatical in the lab of Dan Nathans, where I learned molecular biology and had a chance to experience in person Dan's calm wisdom and acute scientific insights. My first exposure to ASHG came, was at the 1975 meeting in Baltimore. Already committed to genetics, I can remember the exciting science that I heard and the presentations, uh, the per personalities that I met. From, the from that point forward, I continued to be active in ASHG in virtually every possible capacity. I urge young people here for the first time to follow this same path, and I can guarantee you that you will treasure the experiences and learn from them. In any event, <clears throat> these are the experiences and mentors that molded me and brought me to the podium today. Some thoughts before uh, closing my closing remarks. As our president told us in her address, we are privileged to be in genetics at this time and place. Our field is leading the revolution in medicine to a more informed and individualized activity that improves prevention and enhances care. It is our responsibility to lead the integration of genetics into medicine. We should be rigorous in assessing what we know and what we don't know, and continue to push for progress across all fronts, from basic science to social concerns. We should not be paralyzed by uncertainty. Rather, we should consider all possibilities, make an informed plan, monitor our progress, and be willing to change course when new knowledge is available. Second, we have much yet to learn. I, this was brought to my attention just recently when I saw a patient, uh, talk to the patient's father, an inner city Baltimore family, and I explained uh, where we were and uh, what we had eliminated and told the father that we thought that they had a one in four or 25% chance for having another such affected child. And he looked up at me and he said, can't you do better than that, Doc? So we do indeed have much yet to learn. We should continue to reach out and interact with our scientific colleagues in other fields, engineering, computer science, computation, and especially throughout all biology. To paraphrase Max Delbruck, all living beings have a common ancestry. We should take advantage of this fact. Last night, too few of us heard the wonderful story of the discovery of microRNAs at the Gruber Award Ceremony. The enthusiasm of the awardees, Victor Ambrose, Gary Rufkin, and David Balcombe, was palpable. Their transformative discovery came from work on plants, worms, and eventually vertebrates. ASHG should continue to promote these interactions, which will speed our scientific advances and broaden our horizons. Third, and as emphasized by our previous awardee, I would like to emphasize the value of participating in the education of others, be they students, colleagues, patients, or the lay uh, public. The secret is, of course, that the teacher always learns more than the student. I urge all of you to drink from this fountain. Finally, regardless of the area, area of genetics that occupies you, get excited. Do not be complacent. 
Be rigorous, be skeptical, do the experiment, test the hypothesis and learn from it. And like Victor, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. In closing, I have many to thank. First, my colleagues here at ASHG and at Johns Hopkins, and my many students and trainees. You have enriched my life and continue to keep me on my toes, up to date and ready for the next challenge, and I am ready for the next challenge. Second, I have been blessed by having a stellar and dedicated uh, core support team. My two lab technicians, Gary Steele and Cassandra Obi, and my administrative assistant, Sandy Maselli, keep the lab running and me on track. In aggregate, this team has been together for more than 100 years. Last and most importantly, I thank my family. My parents, Joy and Bob Valley, are still healthy and have always supported me and let me do my own thing, even when they did not uh, understand what in the world it was. I'm very thankful for that. My son, Josh, a teacher who makes me proud, my daughter-in-law, Mary, and my granddaughter, Margaret, who I can tell you from a completely unbiased point of view is truly exceptional. <laughs> Lastly, and most importantly, my wife, Susan, who has been with me through thick and thin since that blind date in 1961. Your love, support, and patience have made my life exciting, worthwhile, and worthwhile. Nothing would have been possible without you. Thank you very much. Thank you.